Good morning from Washington, D.C. My name is Lauren Reese. Together with my colleagues in the Environmental Change and Security Program, it's my privilege to welcome you to today's event, 10 Years in Nepal, what the Haryoban program taught us about integrating community resilience, climate adaptation, and biodiversity conservation. In keeping with one of the themes of the Haryoban program, planning today's event was a really collaborative effort, and I'd like to thank the Haryoban team, the staff in WWF, CARE, FICO Fund, and USAID for helping to pull it all together. For those of you joining a Wilson Center event for the first time, a special welcome and a quick word about where you're tuning into. The Wilson Center is the living memorial to President Wilson. Our mandate is to bridge the worlds of policy, practice, and research through nonpartisan, independent analysis and open dialogue. The Environmental Change and Security Program, or ECSP, works to build these bridges around issues related to non-traditional security, connecting the intersection of environmental change, health, and security to foreign policy and international development. Today's panel is a real treat for us to host. In my 10 plus years with ECSP, the Haryoban program has consistently yielded really important insights and lessons learned on how integrated development programs built on and supported by long-term partnerships working across multiple levels of decision-making can help to conserve critical ecosystems and improve climate adaptation through a holistic approach that includes not only climate vulnerability assessments, but also gender empowerment, education, healthcare, and family planning. It's my privilege to introduce Nick Sekran for opening remarks. Nick is the Chief Conservation Officer at the World Wildlife Fund US, overseeing work on wildlife protection, forest conservation, oceans and water, re water resources management, food production and markets, and climate change. Nick is a longtime builder of bridges between the conservation and development worlds. Prior to his recent appointment to WWF US, Nick served as the Director for Sustainable Development at UNDP, where he established the first biodiversity policy framework adopted by a multilateral development agency. Over a 26 year career, he has worked on conservation and development on the ground in over 45 countries. His specific focus has been the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity, including wildlife, fish stocks and forests, ecosystem management and conservation compatible development. Over to you, Nick. Thank you so much, Lauren. Although the Haryaban program predates the sustainable development goals, um, I have to say, and I had the privilege of, 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 of visiting Nepal and, 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 and seeing work on the ground um, under the project. It's one of the best examples of a sustainable development initiative I've seen anywhere. You know, the sustainable development goals can be um, reduced into a, a three platform agenda. Is how do we ensure prosperity for the future? How do we ensure, you know, the future of the jobs, um, you know, the wealth accumulation, poverty eradication, and all the other associated fundamentals of, of um, economic sustainability. But equally, it's around ensuring equality. It's about dealing with the huge inequities um, that we see around the planet. It's about dealing with um, um, women's economic empowerment and, 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 and all the other issues that are necessary in order to create um, uh, and, and um, you know, stable functioning um, societies. And then finally, it's about decoupling economic growth from environmental degradation. So if you like, the sustainable development agenda can be reduced into a simultaneous equation in terms of how you do those three things. And of course, um, you know, the answer um, will depend on where you work. And I think obviously the Haryoban program um, was designed specifically to meet the specific circumstances in, 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 in Nepal. And, and I think has been very successful. Now this year um, is a major year in, the, uh, you know, in terms of the global policy agenda um, on, the on two fronts, biological diversity and climate change. We will see whether or not the conference of parties um, to, you know, dealing with biological diversity and climate change respectively will meet as a result of, of COVID-19. But should they meet, um, there is a huge um, agenda in front of them. And of course, in, in climate change, it's around ensuring that the, um, you know, the meat of the Paris Declaration is met and that you know, we drastically reduce emissions and, and, we, and we, you know, manage the major decarbonization of the global economy and we protect nature and, and, and you know, so vital to ensuring our climate security. And on biological diversity, it's around ensuring that we're reversing the trends of biological diversity loss around the world, but ensuring 
that um, the stewards of biodiversity, local communities, indigenous people, and others, you know, benefit from that biodiversity are able to use it sustainably. And so the Haribang program has done many of these things. Um, and, you know, from the climate perspective, it focused more on the adaptation side. I have to say that, um, you know, there are a lot of lessons to be drawn from it. Um, um, you know, for USAID, this has been, I think, a really great investment. We thank, thank USAID for that support. On our side in WWF, it's been wonderful to have so many local partners and also, you know, working with CARE, um, you know, truly takes a village to achieve sustainable development. And I think that that is what we have seen here. In Nepal has been a good news story on, 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 on the environment front, because notwithstanding lots of challenges, and you know transitions in terms of governance and, and, and so on and so forth. We have seen um, a strong support across successive governments for um, environmental protection. We've seen an increase in forest cover over the past few decades. Populations of tigers and rhinos have, are building up again. And we have very strong support at the grassroots level from um, local communities and civil society for the agenda. And I think this, in this context, it's not something that we see everywhere. So, you know, today's conversation, really important to try and unpack what is it that was specific to Nepal, which, which, which was, you know, um, you know, critical determinant of success and what it is, um, you know, that, that um, uh, is really um, transferable to work globally. So I just want to end here by thanking USAID for um, support over the years thanking the Woodrow Wilson Center for hosting this event and wishing um, um, everyone a, a wonderful event this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Thank you for your leadership and also setting us up for a really great discussion today. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's turn now to our panel. I'm going to start by introducing the panelists. We'll then have a short presentation by Judy Oglethorpe about the Haryoban program, followed by a discussion with the full panel. We will reserve the last 15 minutes or so for Q&A, so please feel free to email your questions at any point in the discussion to ecsp at wilsoncenter.org. Please indicate your name, title, and affiliation with your submitted question. And if that wasn't clear, the information to do so is just below the video on the screen that you're looking at. So just scroll down and you'll see the email address there. Uh, so now for introductions, uh, I'm going to go in alphabetical order. David Chalmers is the acting director of USAID Nepal's Social, Environmental and Economic Development Office. In this role, he oversees an array of development partnerships focused on food security, natural resource management, energy and resilience, including most notably <coughs> for present purposes, the Hario Bond II partnership. Dr. Maheswar Dakal is a Joint Secretary of Government and of Nepal, currently serving as the Secretary of Ministry of Industry, Tourism, Forests and Environment for Gandaki Province. Prior to this position, he was the Chief of Climate Change Management Division and National Project Director of Nepal's National Adaptation Plan. Maheswar has extensive experience in forest management, protected area management, biodiversity conservation, forest and watershed and community development, landscape level policy planning and decision making, and multilateral environmental agreements. Judy Oglethorpe with, was chief of party for WWF on the first phase of the Hario Bond program in Nepal. Before that, she worked for WWF on climate adaptation, population health environment programming, community-based conservation, armed conflict and conservation, and large-scale conservation approaches. Judy also has 14 years of conservation experience in East and Southern Africa. Bharati Patak is currently working as the chairperson of the Federation of Community Forestry Users Nepal, or FICO Fund. She is a master's graduate in rural development. Born and raised in Makwanpur, Nepal, she has worked for more than 25 years in the community forestry rights sector of Nepal. Mona Sherpa is a women's rights activist with over 20 years experience in the development sector, specializing in gender, social inclusion, and governance. She is currently the Assistant Country Director of CARE Nepal, where she leads the business development, program quality, and learning portfolio. She is a prominent figure in Nepal's social movements and has contributed in strengthening advocacy and policy framework reform for equitable actions through her association with various regional and global movements. 
Again, we'll reserve the last 15 minutes or so for questions, so please email your questions at any point in the discussion. Uh, I'm gonna turn it over now to Judy Oglethorpe for a presentation on the program. Thank you very much, Lauren. And uh, I was very privileged to work in Nepal for five years on the first phase of Haribán. And I have to say that those were some of the most rewarding years of my, of my career. Um, so today I'm going to talk about the, the background environment for the program in Nepal. Then I'm going to talk about Haribán, uh, how it responded to changes and opportunities. And then I'm going to finish up with some key successes and lessons. The name Haribán means green forests in Nepali. And it comes from a saying uh, that green forests are the wealth of Nepal. And, and as, as mentioned, it's funded by USA, USAID, it's already been mentioned. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna start off with the, the, the timeline of, of background events to the program. And, and what you see on the slide here is before, before Haribán. Going to go back 25 years uh, when Nepal unfortunately went through uh, 10 years of the Maoist insurgency um, with great loss of life and um, severe civil disturbance um, affecting everybody in the country, including those rural communities dependent on forests. Um, the peace agreement between the government and the Maoists came in 2006. The monarchy ended in 2007. In 2008, uh, Nepal became a republic and elections were held. A coalition government was formed by the Maoists, um, but was subsequently pulled out. And then for the following years, there was impasse over the constitution. So if I could have the next slide, please. Um, so this was the setting when Haribán started with a transition to peace, a success of governments and efforts to develop a constitution. Uh, and this process continued. So in the same year that the project started, um, 2011, the United Nations Peace Monitoring Mission ended. The following year, uh, there was integration of the former rebel fighters into the military as part of the peace process. Uh, but yet again, the Constituent Assembly dissolved after failing to produce a, a, a draft constitution. There was severe flooding in the Terai in 2014, 2017. And then 2015, a major earthquake hit Nepal um, with the epicenter in, in the middle of one of the landscapes where Haribán works, a severe loss of life, damage to property and infrastructure, uh, and severe impacts on, on rural households. Um, a few months later, the, the constitution was finally passed, defining Nepal as a secular country. Um, and that was followed by a six, six month blockade of the Indian border protesting the constitution which meant severe fuel shortages in the country and uh, huge problems in doing um, recovery and reconstruction work because materials couldn't get in. Um, in 2017, uh, on, on the bright side, um, so general election was held and government was restructured. Uh, and then in 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic struck and, and severely affected Nepal. So that's the, that's the background to, to Haribán um, in the years leading up to it and, and then during its, its 10 years. Could I have the next slide, please? So the goal of the Haribán program is to increase ecological and community resilience in two biodiverse landscapes in Nepal. It has two main components, biodiversity conservation and climate adaptation. In the first phase, there was also a climate mitigation, a sustainable landscapes component. Uh, and then the program has three cross-cutting themes, gender and social inclusion, governance, and market-based livelihoods. Next slide, please. Um, so Haribán is all about partnerships. Uh, the program is, is uh, implemented by a consortium led by WWF um, with Care Nepal, uh, Federation of Community Forest Users Nepal, FICA Fund, and the National Trust for, for Nature Conservation. Um, the, the project partners very closely with many forest dependent indigenous peoples and local communities. We work for the government of Nepal at national, provincial and local level um, with USAID, who is much more than just a donor, a really true partner. And then with other NGOs, communities, um, community based organizations, private sector and academia. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, the project works in 
two major landscapes in Nepal, the Chiton Annapurna landscape, which goes uh, covers the whole of the Gandaki Basin in Nepal, and it goes from the high peaks of the Annapurna, Manaslu, and Langtang ranges at over 8,000 8, meters, all the way down almost to sea level to, to about 200 meters um, on the Indian border. So just an incredible landscape with a, a wide range of vegetation types and, and, uh, and um, also um, many different peoples living, living there. The Terai Arc landscape lies along the uh, the, the, the low lying Terai area um, on, on the Indian border. It's it was set up to connect protected isolated protected areas uh, through buffer zones and corridors um, to conserve species like tiger and one horned rhino. Um, and communities are managing the corridors and, and the buffer zones, the forests in there. Millions of people live in, in the corridors, many of them in the, in, the, in the whole landscapes, and many of them are dependent on forest resources for their uh, livelihoods and well-being. So if I could have the next slide, please. Thank you. So just to, to mention that in Nepal, 23% of the country is covered by protected areas, and 45% of the land is covered by forest, with 38% of this being community forest. The country is, is recognized globally as having a hugely successful model of, of community forestry uh, de with decentralized forest management. And there are over 20,000 community forest user groups in the country, with FICA fund providing the largest network. And over 50% of the rural population is actually engaged in, in community forest management. Okay, next slide, please. So the theory of change of the program is if stakeholders are able to better conserve and benefit from biodiverse natural resources and adapt to climate change in a manner that diversifies livelihood options, improves gender equality and social inclusion, and promotes good natural resource governance, then people and ecosystems in the target landscapes will be more resilient. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I'm going to talk about the, the main components of the, of the project. Um, the biodiversity conservation component has a major focus on tackling threats, including over harvesting of forest products, especially firewood. It works to control, to uh, avoid uncontrolled fires, it works on wildlife crime and human wildlife conflict. Um, it works to restore the landscapes with a major focus on ecosystem services and promoting climate resilience for species and ecosystems. And this includes, uh, for example, refugia, places which will, where where species and ecosystems will persist as, as things change elsewhere, and also climate corridors so that species can move along gradients um, to survive as, as climate conditions change. The program also works on reducing human wildlife conflict, both by trying to prevent it with fencing and, and corrals and so on, but also with compensation schemes. And this is especially important since the wildlife numbers are increasing. Next slide, please. Um, the program works on livelihood support, trying to working to improve the livelihoods of poor and vulnerable forest dependent people in key parts of the landscape. Um, working on market based enterprises and and also providing skills training for forest dependent youth to try to uh, enable them to stay in the area rather than migrating out for for work. Um, and playing an active role in their in their, the management of their forests. And many of these livelihoods are planned so that they're climate smart. Uh, so for example, this greenhouse here is enabling people to grow out of season crops when their traditional crops are failing because of changes in, in rainfall patterns and, and, and temperatures. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned that the program in the first phase had a, a climate mitigation component. Uh, and this worked to, to uh, support national red plus readiness and tackle drivers of deforestation and forest degradation, including promoting alternative energy to reduce the huge demand for firewood in the country. Next slide, please. Um, the climate adaptation component uh, has worked with the local municipalities to incorporate some of the adaptation planning that was done in the first phase. Um, into their regular planning and budgets. And this is really helping to 
ensure sustainability and scaling up the adaptation work that the, the, the program started. Some of the main vulnerabilities that people have are, are um, impacts on agriculture, uh, loss of water supplies with more irregular rainfall, uh, but also with the heavier rainfall when it, when it does rain, um, resulting in landslides and floods. And so uh, the, the program uh, incorporated nature-based solutions to try to build resilience to this. And this has included, for example, watershed management with collaboration between upstream and downstream users. Next slide, please. Uh, the program works to improve the internal governance of natural resource management groups, uh, helping them to uh, improve their internal systems, improve their technical management of their forests, um, and also in, in um, ensuring that there's a fair benefit sharing of the, the benefits from community forests. Um, and uh, one of the important things that they've been doing is, is leveraging resources to help them with their, their work in managing their forests. Um, natural resource management groups have actually leveraged 1.3 million dollars and along with other groups working, other partners working with the project, the program has, has helped partners to leverage about $1.8 million altogether. Next slide, please. Um, the program also has a component on gender and social inclusion. Um, and this has been, uh, this cuts across both the, the biodiversity conservation work, the forest management, um, and also climate adaptation. The community learning and action centers were set up to bring together marginalized people, women, um, to help to understand what their issues were, uh, build their self-confidence, help to tackle their issues, and educate them about their rights to sharing benefits from forests um, and play a role in decision making in their forests. Um, in the course of this process, we had to, we realized that we had to tackle gender-based violence so that women could participate in the project safely and, and benefit from it. Uh, next slide, please. So, um, you know, I've mentioned a lot of the changes that happened in the course of the program. Uh, once the uh, federal government was established, we were able to work at all levels with the new government uh, for a better enabling environment, uh, providing inputs to several policies. Um, and then this also helped with scaling up and sustainability. Um, we responded to disasters. So for example, um, after, the, after the 2015 earthquake, uh, and then the program also, for example, had to adapt to ways of working and helping uh, communities and partners during the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. Um, so factors contributing to the program's success. I, I think that the composition of the program's consortium with both development and conservation NGOs was very important because that gave us a much broader reach. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of these now. Some of them will come up in the panel discussion. Um, but for example, we had a small grants program that enabled us to reach further um, to, to support new partners, to take risks, trying out new activities. Uh, some of them worked. If they didn't, it, you know, some of them didn't. But, but we could take risks and try new approaches. And then it also enabled us to respond quickly to emergencies. And then finally, I think... Um, one other thing that was was key to the program was was having 10 years because it takes a long time to build trust and relationships in these complex situations. Next slide, please. So some of the lessons that we learned, um, and there are many more, obviously, uh, but I think, you know, ensuring that there's adequate knowledge before going into the field. And this includes knowing where the critical parts of the landscape are to work rather than being spread too thinly. Um, adopting a river basin approach in landscape conservation and I think you know having a greater focus on water we, we did come to have a great focus on water but I think having if we could have had a greater focus on water right from the beginning it would have been great um, involving the private sector early on uh, to bring in their advice to know what their interests are uh, when developing livelihood and enterprise models would have been helpful um, and then ensuring that we were collecting enough baseline data in order to quantify results and, and demonstrate the scale of achievements. Next slide, please. So 
Uh, I'm just about winding up. Uh, I just want to acknowledge the huge commitment of many people who made the Harry Oban program possible, including all the consortium partners um, and the core program team. Um, the government of Nepal, which has been uh, a really amazing partner to work with. Uh, USAID, we many, many thanks for, for all your support. Uh, I want to say a big thank you to all the Indigenous peoples, communities and community-based organisations uh, who we had the, the privilege of working with. Um, other civil society partners, the private sector partners and academic institutions. Thank you all very, very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. That was a really concise and clear presentation of a very complex and long lasting project. So I appreciate um, your remarks. I think, you know, one of the things that really stood out to me in the presentation was how Haryabhan was able to operate in such a complex and changing situation um, and also cover a number of, of sectors. Can you take a minute to talk about how the program really took on complexity as an issue and, and how it was able to deal with um, the, the added stressors and shocks that came with the 10 year period. Yeah, thank you. I think um, th there were several factors involved. I think the fact that we could work across multiple scales really enabled us to angle our approaches. Uh, at, you know, we could work at the right scale for the right issue, um, so ecologically, socially, and politically. And this was meant going from community to national scale, from site level to landscape scale. So being able to, to move across different scales was really valuable. Um, another thing that I think really, really helped us was that our USAID funding enabled a very broad approach. We could span many different disciplines, um, especially for the climate adaptation work. So for example, you know, we could apply this in any way to reduce climate vulnerability, and it could be watershed restoration to reduce the risk of landslides and flooding, uh, to, for example, tackling adolescent girl, uh, school girls' attendance at school by providing schools with better toilets and water supplies. Um, for me, it was a really welcome change from projects I managed in the past, which were where the funding was much more stovepiped. So this was, was a really fantastic thing. Um, and the fact that the funding gave us flexibility to respond to new opportunities, um, the grants program being an example of that. Um, I think having livelihoods, governance and, Je and Jesse, gender and social inclusion as cross-cutting components was really valuable and it enabled us to bring the main components closer together as well and, and enabled us to tackle a lot of societal issues which were essential in order to achieve the, pro the program's objectives. Um, partnerships was another important aspect. So I mentioned that our consortium had two conservation, two development organisations two international organizations and two national. And this gave us technical expertise to span many different disciplines. Um, and all the partners brought unique contributions. Uh, so FICAVAN and the National Trust for Nature Conservation provided tremendous reach to, to the local communities in their networks um, in the landscape, uh, which was really, really important to be able to, to get down to that grassroots level. Um, CARE provided cutting edge gender and social inclusion and governance approaches um, and, and climate adaptation communities. And then WWF provided the landscape level approach and, and some of the biodiversity work. So I think all of this helped us to respond to shocks, for example, such as the earthquake. Hey, Just and the, have you got the meeting open yet? And, I'm sorry, um, uh, sorry, Judy. John, you're <laughs> unmuted. We have a little background noise, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so yeah, I think this, this diversity of partners was really important. So for example, when we responded to the 2015 earthquake, all partners did relief work uh, and TNC helped to reach very remote communities uh, by reconstructing trails um, so that um, those communities could, could rebuild their lives. Um, CARE taught us how to do cash for work uh, to, to kickstart household economies. WWF brought in green recovery and reconstruction, promoting sound environmental practices to help build future resilience. Um, working with government was obviously very important. Um, so building on our relationships with government, we were able to uh, help to provide inputs to policy, for example. Um, 
And then once the, the new government was established, working with the municipalities was key to getting some of our approach, approaches embedded and, and, and scaled up. So thank you. Thank you, Judy. It's a lot, a lot of lessons packed in. Um, you know, you mentioned gender empowerment and social inclusion as an important cross-cutting component to Hari Oban. I actually remember uh, Melanie Nakagawa, who was at the time Secretary Kerry's policy planning staff. This was probably about six or seven years ago. She spoke at the Wilson Center and talked about how she visited a Hari Oban project and learned from women in the community that their participation had increased from 30 to 50% on the community um, groups, forestry groups, and they were able to make a more active role in decision-making because of the training on governance and organization and gender equity that the community had received. Um, Bharati, can you tell us more about how the program was able to improve governance and integrate gender and social inclusion in community forests? Uh, is this something that FICO Fund plans to continue and, and perhaps scale up in the future? Yeah. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Um, so, thank you so much giving this opportunity. And Judy already mentioned the uh, all uh, coverage the like a Haryoban example in Nepal and GCN governance and climate change all in governance process. So, um, uh, FECOPON and Haryoban project uh, are spending more time in the community forest users group in Nepal. She already mentioned uh, her presentation. Uh, so, starting phase in FECOPON uh, playing to the very good role for the policy advocacy process, like uh, our government uh, making and already made a uh, different policy and act and the guideline and forest sector uh, policy. So that time we uh, advocating and that we uh, organize the dialogue with the government, bureaucrats and different level stakeholder uh, about the community rights and the women rights and the who are marginalized people who are working in the community level. So we are um, continue dialogue with the um, government and different stakeholders. So uh, we improved in the community level and the governance and the uh, JC process uh, in the grassroots level. So uh, in the example, very um, uh, good and the uh, model example in the community forest, you know, uh, our uh, forest act and the recently uh, we got a forest act. Uh, there is the provision of the uh, total community forest income uh, uh, and the 50% uh, resource allocated to the women empowerment and the poor people. So this is a very good uh, um, uh, like uh, act uh, for the community people. So we are investing more time in the Haryoban consulting partner, all the stakeholder and government and the, uh, we are playing to the very good role. And similarly in the, our forest policy also very, very good in Nepal. So there is the more highlighted to the women and the poor people and who are staying in the grassroots table, there is the more uh, contribution for the uh, policy making process. This is the like a very interlinkage to the governance and JC issues. And not only in the recent policy and act, we made the community forestry guideline, you know, is a uh, very, very good example and the, like a beauty for the community forestry and the women participation in the decision making process in the 50% women uh, are in the uh, community forest users group. But this is the uh, like, a, uh, is the like a, our uh, community forestry guideline and take a ownership in the took a ownership for the government so this is a very good example is the Haryoban project we made a community forestry guideline and collectively and so we are implementing uh, in the grassroots level in the community forestry guideline uh, from the Haryoban project and all consulting partner so this is the very 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 um, good practice in uh, Nepal and the, in the community forest users group. And similarly, uh, we are working and we are going to very closely work in the grassroots level and the governance and the JC and all are together on that agenda. 
uh, so one is one was the implement, important for the how can we implement this on the our policy in the grassroots level that is the very interlinkage for the jc and the governance process so so this is our um, uh, improvement from the hari urban project in the community users community forest users group and the other uh, natural resource group in the grassroots level so another is the you know uh, like uh, uh, is the more supported to from the Haryaban project and the capacity building for the institutionally and the community based organization and the community forest users group in grassroots level, uh, especially and the gender equity and social inclusion and the like a uh, um, uh, uh, different types of the support to the community member. Uh, like a, a leadership, uh, increase the uh, like a leadership. So that types of the we can see in the grassroots level, in the especially and all over the country in community forest users group are implementing the our guideline and the coming the women leadership and the poor people and the indigenous people and the Dalit community. But Haryaban program uh, area and the very closely we are working and every time we are discussing and supporting to the people like a, there is the uh, like a like a public hearing uh, in the grassroots level and CFUG level there is the uh, continued assembly and the meeting and uh, so that types of the activity are organizing in the community forest users group so there is a very active role are playing in the community forest users group uh, so uh, all are in the collective effort uh, uh, so uh, we are spending more time in the Haryoban area. There is the actively engagement in the forest management for the local people and indigenous people. So we are thinking to the how can we go, how can we support to the uh, like uh, poor people and the women and the indigenous people. So um, uh, they got a chance for the Haryoban from the Haryoban process and support to the livelihood and many women and the grassroots women. We got uh, they got a chance for the like a livelihood uh, supported program and the uh, and the uh, especially in fake open uh, we got a chance we 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 developed the capacity from the haryoban project and the uh, all policy making process time so we made a jc a strategy and uh, we made a like a jc action plan and we made the ip's action plan so we made the uh, anti corruption uh, policies and institutionally, so there is the uh, some are supported to the all partners learning. Uh, so, so that is the like uh, achievement. That is the is the success for the like a uh, fake open also. So, uh, we organized the gender-based violence against the gender-based violence campaign in the community forest users group. So, uh, I already mentioned the before uh, our panel discussion also, and every year we are mobilizing to the more than like uh, two hundred. Uh, uh, thousand uh, uh, people are mobilizing the uh, against the gender-based violence. So, so this is the very uh, largest civil society network. So we mobilized to the uh, local community and we uh, made a community mobilization like a guideline also. So we prepared to the some guideline with the consulting partner, like especially Kier Nepal and Haryoban and other consulting partner, uh, like actively engagement there. But that will be that guideline will be supported to the like a governance process and improve the governance in the community forest users group. So so that that is the um, like a positive and the. Um, uh, activity in the uh, from the Haryoban project. So we we are uh, uh, working many things. We got uh, many things uh, success activity in the grassroots level and CFUG level. So we thinking we are thinking to the uh, scale up, you know, and the, uh, our best practice. All CFUG we are trying to make a like a model. But we we started uh, like a uh, around like a uh, twelve CFUG from the Haryaban supported program in the model CFUG, and uh, now there is the like a uh, uh, mainstreaming the women's in the CFUG in model CFUG. 
this is the very good example and the, like a, there is the well-being ranking practice in the CFUG level, like a, there is the regular meeting and they made a plan for the sustainable forest management plan. They are conserving the forest area and the biodiversity and the water and everything. They are conserving the soil also in the grassroots table and they are the um, empowering the women. There is the uh, like uh, allocated the resource for the livelihood and there is a very close relation with the local government you know this is the very 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 success uh, uh, like a practice just the and the second phase Haryabon program we are started to the very close relation local government uh, and the community forest users group and the local federation and the province government and the federal government also supported to the uh, like a uh, some grant to the community forest users group this is the like a uh, multiple effort and the uh, community users group got a chance uh, got it the chance. So that types of the um, activity and the well coordination, uh, like a uh, uh, record keeping system and the documentation and re regular public hearing, that types of the activity, like uh, improving in the community forest users group. So that is the very good uh, achievement. And another, uh, we are thinking to the uh, like a uh, uh, scale up in the future. So many things we are in the fake open, uh, we are making to the next 25 years, the roadmap. So um, uh, overall, uh, like a uh, uh, gender-based violence, against the gender-based violence, this is the, our commitment. This is the, our community forest users group commitment. I think our all consult team and the government also committed to the against the gender-based violence. So we are thinking the, how can support to the economic empowerment through the community forest users group to the poor people, women and marginalized group and the indigenous people. So they are waiting our like a strategy and the, our plan and the, our like a, uh, how is the investment plan and the, how, we, how we can thinking. So that types of the activity and plan are waiting in the community forest users group and we are thinking. And another is the, we, are, we already made a plan for the scale up in the outside of the Haryoban area and our model CFUG practice. So that is the very important. So FECOFON already made our, our council meeting, just we finished the council meeting. We'll go to the other district, other municipality and other CFUG, our practice, model CFUG practice. So this is the very important. I think maybe uh, we are thinking to the uh, regular campaign, like advocacy and my source are also in here. We need to sometime in the push the, our government made a policy is not is the federal government and federal government province government and the local government uh, like a need to uh, uh, like a um, actively engagement in policy making process how can we made a policy and act favor to the local community okay. so so that types of the engagement and the campaign and the dialogue and meeting and we will organize and we are thinking that types of the activity and scale up and the other mm -hmm. Uh, district and <clears throat> another Parati, is that I'm gonna oh. I'm gonna I want to come back to you on some of that um but I I want to get to the next question for Mona and there are questions coming in from the audience so I want to make sure that we have enough time I know that okay. there's like a wealth of of knowledge and experience and I want to hear more so let me come thank back you. to you in a few minutes okay, okay thank you all right thank, thank you, you. You know, Mona, you have a deep background in these issues as well. Uh, can you talk about the significance of having governance and gender empowerment and social in inclusion? I, I, sorry, I spell out the whole thing. I know we call it Jesse, um, but I also think for some people, they're thinking about the song, Jesse's Girl, when they hear that. So I just want to make sure that we spell it out sometimes. Um, so the significance of having governance and gender empowerment and social inclusion mainstreamed into a project like this uh, and is this something that you've seen commonly done in other projects in other countries thank you lauren for your question um actually you made my life easier by spelling out the whole <laughs> full form of jc gender equality and social inclusion so now onwards i will be saying jc um uh, you saw it in judy's presentation and bharati also spoke about it um, and if, uh, like, you know, we look at it globally, but also here in Nepal, especially in um, the changing political and the sociocultural context of Nepal, the kind of commitment that government has, the kind of moral support that the people has, and the kind of um, assurance or 
the proven understanding that we have built through different initiative on the importance of people their like you know very nuanced understanding of the social dynamics and its importance in every sector uh, i think like is already established um, and then its importance is already there however like you know when we look into hadyoban this whole 10 years of engagement um, from its theory of change to the kind of um, very uh, nuanced objective that we had in Horio Ban uh, and the kind of result that we achieved there, you know, which is quite sustainable, which brought in like, you know, people from different sectors together. And it's not just, you know, technocratic solution, but something which also brings in the social dynamics with that cyclical kind of reflection and practice. You know, it has already proven the importance of JC and governance uh, in any sector, but then more on conservation sector. Um, and then thanks to Haryoban because Haryoban has proven that. Um, how it happened, why it happened, you know, it is very important to understand that so that we can scale it up in other sectors also. Um, if we look into Nepal, Nepal is a country uh, which very much practiced uh, subsistence, you know, agriculture model, okay, subsistence um, economic model. Um, so people like, you know, especially women, indigenous community, Dalit community deciding very close to the forest areas are the ones who are the managers of the natural resources, but also the benefit sharing and those kind of practices were there established from day one, like, you know, it's in most of the rural communities, we see that. But in recent times, along with the political and cultural shift, along with the new policies, um, sorry, but like, you know, most of the time it is um, either developed by technocrats or men in the decision making, uh, like, you know, it completely brushed off that that very importance of benefits sharing between the communities, the upstream, downstream communities, not just that, but also the importance of local knowledge, local understanding, the local, um, you know, very strong knowledge and skill of you know, natural resource management completely got brushed off from the uh, the policy arena. And then, um, like, you know, after the midterm, like the midterm review of Aryoban 1, the different assessment that we did in Aryoban also very clearly noted that. And then that actually gave Aryoban a good platform to work on improving internal JC policies, standards, the governance practices, you know, of the users committee, but also of the consortium itself, who are the pioneers or the ones like, you know, who actively engaging in conservation area, biodiversity conservation area. Uh, at the same time, Haryoban also mm, uh, gave emphasis on like, you know, more women, youth, marginalized people, um, and engage them in effective leadership leadership, decision making um, and advocacy, because it was very noted that like, you know, as Bharti was also mentioning, they are the ones who are taking care of the natural resources, but then they are the ones who are completely skipped from the policy making processes. They are the ones who are like, you know, benefiting out of these natural resources, be it firewood, be it livelihood, be it any kind of like, you know, fuels, photos, or any, any sort of like, you know, the effort, but then which was very much like, you know, subsistence based, but with the new policies, which, um, uh, which brought in the commercial aspect, uh, you know, turned forest into not something which is the source of livelihood, source of like, you know, subsistence household economy, but as a timber, you know, and that whole shift actually brushed off again, like, you know, put aside the importance of engagement of women, uh, Dalit, you know, uh, the indigenous communities uh, in these different practices. So uh, something that we did uh, in Haryoban which helped um, us to come up with like the very strong result of developing be it 340 kapas, you know, or 96 lapas, which looked into women's engagement, Dalit's engagement, marginalized, like, you know, indigenous communities engagement, their differential uh, need, but also the differential impact of climate change in their lives. And then catering that with a very strong understanding those differential need and catering like you know solutions around it uh, in these different uh, policies actually help to have a very concrete sort of solutions for the con like in, in the conservation area um, you know so something that we did was sounds very simple but very powerful i must say um, like social analysis tool that we use which didn't like you know which looked into 
what are the gender roles what are the different roles that these people are uh, like you know who are very much uh, dependent on the natural resource and forest are uh, you know taking up uh, what kind of importance it hold who has more threat who are more vulnerable you know and then why they are vulnerable is it just because of the climate change or also because of the social construct you know is it just because of um again the like you know conservation related uh, technical aspects or also because you know uh, the the impact of climate change itself is more on them or because they are lesser in power relation or why they are in a threatful situation what makes them vulnerable you know so those kind of power mapping um, resource mapping well being rank, okay, ranking and understanding in what strata they fall whose dependency on these natural resources is more you know that kind of um, uh, analysis that kind of assessment actually helped how you want to build a very localized uh, very like you know practical kind of solution and and when something is more practical when something really considers the social cultural dynamics of the community um, and comes up with the very localized solution that becomes more sustainable and how you one with the use of you know that kind of effort um, uh, we could we could bring in um, uh, that important aspects of jc in the in the conservation area but also when we look into jc like you know what we always say is what is the position of these vulnerable and marginalized community and what is their condition so you know and then when we look into both the position and condition that is where we'll also look into one definitely there as i said earlier their dependency on the forest natural resource um uh, resources but also in terms of power where they are you know in different assessment we definitely found out there was a huge gap in leadership there was a huge gap in capacity there was a huge gap in their you know using their indigenous skills but also filling up with the required technical skills on them so that these both can come together you know there was a huge gap around it so something that haryoban did through the governance effort and the entry point definitely was as judy was mentioning clac you know this community learning and action um, centers it became an entry entry point where all these women dalit you know indigenous people with a differential need actually could come together those who fell into like you know we had this four different categories of who is like well to do families or who are well to do people and who are not and why you know so in this clack people like you know especially women and men they could actually have a very intense sort of discussion which help them to understand where they are and why they are in that position which itself is a process of conscientization i would say and then with that sort of understanding and information they could get into collective action and also break the culture of violence like you know this voicelessness a culture of silence um, and come up with a very um, strong you know um, 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 uh, solution which actually brought the social dynamics and the conservation together be it like you know dealing with the whole human wildlife conflict issues be it like you know looking into the crime aspect of the like you know conservation or also the climate vulnerabilities so clack actually helped them uh, to to be aware of their situation but also come up with a very concrete action plans and those action plans were the ones who actually which actually uh, like you know covered or catered or captured the local you know knowledge skills of those people along with the technical aspects uh something that haryoban also did i would say like you know uh, and and which also again helped in establishing the importance of jc um, uh, in conservation was as judy was also mentioning that whole landscape you know conservation practice and then that is where nepal you know being a very multicultural multi ethnic community um and natural resource definitely being the source of power many times who holds that and who has the power you know when the upstream like you no know, people or the communities from the upstream areas if has a hold on natural resource what it means to the people in the downstream area and then like you know like people in downstream area but who within those downstream you know people is it women is it dalit like how they are affected you know considering those kind of um 
social dynamics or social political dynamics, the power dynamics, it helped us to come up with a very strong, you know, LAPA, um, and then also like this whole, um, uh, we call it like this integrated sub water, um, can I say management uh, practices, you know, so those kind of uh, plans, we, we could come up with that. And it also helped in reducing the conflict between these upstream and downstream communities, and more work in a very harmonized and coherent manner. So, you know, and then the clack that I mentioned when we got into several sort of discussions and look like, you know, why women are regarded as a second sex or why marginalized community are in that, you know, situation, why they are in a sec secondary position, why they are not part of the policy consultations. Uh, we also figured out like, you know, um, or the women, they also figured out that because of their gender role, because of the confined mobility, because of those like, you know, social norms, which are there, the harmful practices, which are there, they haven't been able to come out. So the good part is when we got into that whole conscientization process in CLAC, you know, they were the ones who themselves came up with these different solutions, be it having a campaign or against gender-based violence or tackling with it, be it like, you know, having a very concrete campaign against um, alcoholism, uh, be it like, you know, having a very strong dialogue with the local government, which is again, like, you know, the aspects of governance, I would say. So those kind of leadership building capacity enhancement, empowerment, you know, it happened only when we had a very thorough analysis of the community be it through the tool like on like you know underlying causes of poverty analysis or social analysis tool or like you know differentiating differential um, okay, impact assessment and response planning and all so those using those tools we could come up with a very strong you know uh, plans and policies and which later on was incorporated in the government's local government's plan you know or their guidelines and then with the right kind of resourcing uh, with the right kind of understanding and internalization by the local government also it got like you know implemented or operationalized and similarly triggered at the various level so you know if we look into this whole aspect many times people say okay it's a conservation program so it will just look into the like you know the technical conservation piece but when we bring in this social dynamics along with the conservation effort, it actually helps us to understand um, uh, things in a different manner. Or it gives a, like you know, as Judy was mentioning, it actually broadens the whole horizon to have a multiple sort of local initiative, which has a sustainable, um, uh, sustainable impact, I would say, you know, which remains even after the project is over, which actually helps to bring in new social norms, new, you know, which which helps those women to be a new woman, I would say, like, you know, or a new man, you know. So even even like, you know, um, like here I'm talking more of women, uh, but then uh, the practice like male champions, mm -hmm. you know, to engage in that whole process, to emancipate themselves from the grip of patriarchy and from that, you know, burden of having leadership all the time, to have a very co-creating kind of environment, you know, where where they together work on any initiatives or any plans, any sol solutions, and working together is always good. So, and conservation and ecology is all biodiversity is all about it, bringing this diverse nature, diverse people, diverse, you know, um, characteristics together. So like, you know, um, that's why I would say it is very important, like, you know, the, the whole JC and governance piece. Um, if we just focus on the technical piece, it might give us a very strong, you know, recommended solution, but then um, to make it happen in a real manner, to come up with a very sustainable sort of solution, social dimension is also equally important. Yeah. And um, it also ensures that whole, um, you know, cyclical, um, reflection, which is very much needed in our current society, I would say. Thank you so much, Mona. Uh, that's a good segue into talking about the role of the government. And Dr. DeCaul, I'd like to turn to you. You know, uh, I think everybody sort of underscored the importance of the project's relationship with the government. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that relationship from your perspective and how did the collaboration work and from, you know, uh, what the a little bit more about the value from the government's perspective of a project like Hario Bon and the importance of that relationship. And I guess, you know, one other question is um, the sustainability of the project once it closes and how the government intends to ensure that. Okay, 
uh, first of all, namaste and very good evening. And thank you very much for all the colleagues here and USAID and the, all the consortium partners. Uh, actually, uh, Judy has already presented all the progress of the project. And Bharati ji and Muna ji has already explained what they achieved during this project. Uh, for me, as the government officers, uh, I was also engaged in the project in the beginning, first phase. Uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate to the consortium partners uh, for their positive partnerships and very natural in natural resource management and very neutral in thematic areas. I mean, you can see the different partners, they have different mandates. And uh, Bharati ji, who is leading the FECO fund, which is the very renowned organizations and leading more than 22,000 community forest user groups and around the 50,000 people are, uh, are in the net network of the community forest. She is leading the organizations and she is the partner and her organization is the one of the best partner in Nepal. I think one of the best reason that the project is successfully implemented. Similarly, the other partners like WWF Nepal and Care Nepal and of course the NTNC, they're very wonderful, very amazing partnerships and very wonderful partnerships among the partners, what I observed from the government side. Uh, in my observations, uh, right from the beginning, the project has designed very strategically because uh, the project steering committee was designed at central level, which is shared by the secretary. And at the same time, the project is also designed the uh, working group, which is led by the planning chief of the ministry and different focal points from the different departments. And I mean, the very good networking uh, right from the beginning. And I think uh, till the project uh, and the networking and that type of institutional mechanism was one of the important part and important aspect of this successful of this project. Uh, my observation was the project was supported uh, to develop and to formulate different policies. Of course, many more. Uh, it's, it's, it's to bias to take just few policies name. Uh, Definitely the project when it was started in 2011, our government setup was different at that time. Because uh, the Haryoban program worked with a different set of the government. But in 2015, uh, there are a number of coincidences in 2015. If you go through the Paris Agreement, this is the another aspect. And if you go through the Sustainable Development Goals, is another milestone in international global school. And at the same time, Sendai framework also you can see over there. Uh, but at the same year, the government uh, has uh, promulgated new constitution in Nepal. And at the same time, we face the earthquake, even uh, the blockade from the Indian side also. We faced the various problems in 2015s. But important part is the Haryoban program is very nicely work with the government, even in the very difficult positions, and is translated into the even different uh, set of the government. Because in after the new constitutions, we have three tiers of the government, and Haryoban program immediately changed the strategy and immediately coordinated with the federal government, provincial government, and local governments. And it was the very wonderful part. And even other projects can learn from the Hario one how they immediately change their strategy with respect to the government structural change. Uh, and regarding to the field achievements and observations, uh, in the beginning, even when I was uh, worked with the Department of National Park and Wildlife Conservations, we uh, involved various activities of species conservations. Uh, particularly rhino, tiger, and other many species. Uh, definitely, uh, this is a good example of the landscape level approach. Uh, in the past, we had a very good experience with the landscape level approach in triarch landscape. Even triarch lands landscape, if you go through its philosophy or principles, the tiger was the fundamental part. But in Chitaun Annapurna landscape is the water set basin or water is the fundamental part, which is the lifeline of each species and its ecosystem and other all human beings as well. Uh, that's why uh, this project has developed a number of 
uh, best practices from the ground. And uh, even though the Nepalese geography and Nepalese society is so diverse, that's why you cannot assume or imagine that you can replicate every best practices to everywhere. It's really difficult in, in our context, but definitely there are some best practices. And the government of Nepal, uh, of course, the provincial government and local government as well, we will uh, replicate. I mean, the, we will uh, outskill and of course the upskilling as well, uh, where and when it will be applicable. Uh, but uh, the project is very much successful, no doubt. But it does not mean that everything is fixed in biodiversity conservation and climate change adaptation or mitigations. As you know, the COVID-19 pandemic just last year, we all people all over the world are equally infested and affected. That's why we have to think uh, differently to conserve our biodiversity because many species uh, and many ecosystems uh, are going to be vulnerable because of different disease and other climate induced disasters and other many reasons. That's why we do not have many choices to go through the green recovery strategy in, in the days to come. Particularly, uh, we have to think about the food security. How do we can support to the local communities to get the good nutrients and good food security? And similarly, the second, of course, we have to think, still, uh, we have to think about the biodiversity. As you know, the tiger and rhino, the population was increased during the Aryoban program, but I'm a bit doubt whether we can preserve them or protect them in the near futures. Even if you go through the sustainable development goals, the goal number 15, which is the life on the land. And the tiger and the rhino, still they are really critical positions. That's why we need a very additional effort. Not only, it does not mean that I'm asking to the donor parts, but of course the government itself should think and allocate as much as possible to conserve those species. And the third part is the water resources and the clean energy is the new issues if we are working on climate change. And Nepal has a very good opportunity to establish the, I mean, the, to produce the clean energy through the hydropower and other solar means. And similarly, tourism, particularly my province where I'm leading here in Gandaki province, which is the very, one of the beautiful city uh, by means of culture and natural resources. And the tourism is a part of green recovery uh, is the best area where the best practices of the Hari Yuban program we can replicate and implement in the near futures. Uh, and similarly, uh, we have to consider the social and gender part, which is Mona and Bharati, they emphasize on it because it's still the people living in the very rural areas and it's particularly women and the children. And the, nowadays, if you, uh, if I'm, I do not wrong, then the senior citizen of the society in the rural area, they are really serious in terms of uh, climate change impact or other uh, scarcity in terms of food security or other facility of the government. That's why we have, to, these are the main areas we have to think in the near futures. Uh, finally, I would like to share my sincere thanks to the United States, the people of the United States to support this program. Uh, and very good partnership with the government of Nepal. Of course, the consortium partners who prove and tested their positiveness, neutrality, and natural in natural resource conservations. And I look forward to see similar type of support in the near futures. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. DeCall. Uh, David, you've been very patient. <laughs> I'm gonna turn to you now. Um, coming back to this issue of complexity, which I think will only continue to see grow in the years ahead. Uh, could you talk a bit about how USAID is dealing with changing risk and how it's working with the government of Nepal on this moving forward? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you, Lauren. It's, it's a great question. And let me start uh, by noting that USAID has been partnering with the government of Nepal for more than 70 years now. Uh, it's, it's, uh, we have quite a history and the development context and risk profile in Nepal has changed a lot uh, in that time. So our programs, our approach to risk management uh, have evolved too. But what hasn't changed 
is our commitment to Nepal and the friendship uh, we share. We have a really strong partnership and I think Hari Oban is, is a great example of that. Uh, so in terms of how we're together dealing with uh, a constantly evolving set of risks, uh, it really is a shared effort between us, the government in Nepal and our partners. Uh, and to start, it's, I think it's important to note that risk comes in many forms. Um, we really try to embrace taking certain types of programmatic risk when doing so is a good chance of generating a large development impact or learning of global relevance. Um, for example, our support for community-based forestry in Nepal, which was uh, rightly mentioned earlier as, as really a, a globally recognized success story, was initially a, a rather risky proposition in that its success was far from assured. With the benefit of hindsight, um, however, it's, you know, it's very clear that that was a risk well worth taking. And we, we see the results on the ground, including through the work of, of Hario Ban and Fico Fund. Um, other forms of risk, uh, you know, we really do everything within our power to eliminate entirely. Uh, for example, we have absolutely zero tolerance for sexual misconduct within our programs, our risk mitigation strategies. In that regard, are, are therefore aggressive and absolute, and, and that's something we're really um, uh, focused on uh, eliminating. Um, but I'd like to focus my contribution today on the broad category of risks that we might characterize as, as programmatic risk or the range of political, environmental, economic factors uh, that can jeopardize hard won development gains and, and derail progress. Uh, as Mr. DeHaul, uh, DeCall knows very well, for example, we know that an increasingly variable climate characterized by more frequent and severe extreme climatic events uh, can undermine decades of development gains and, and very directly threaten health and welfare if, if not addressed. So due to climate change and, and other risk factors, uh, we employ a number of risk mitigation measures across our entire portfolio. That includes environmental safeguards. Uh, for example, the very large majority of our projects have an environmental mitigation and monitoring plan to address um, uh, environmental risks. Uh, climate risk management is, is another major focus area. And at root, that's really about programming for uh, the range of future cl cl climate scenarios climate science tells us are, are possible and likely, and building in flexibility to adjust and adapt our programming uh, accordingly. Uh, that requires really close coordination between us, our partners, and our government counterparts. Um, Mr. DeCall, for example, understands probably better than just about anyone the particular climate issues affecting Gandaki province um, as he addresses and lives those issues every day. So coordination at the provincial, municipal, and of course the national level is, is super important. Um, another thing we're really focused on uh, is adaptive mechanisms and award management. That includes, of course, really robust monitoring. Increasingly, it includes um, implementing mechanisms that can flex and adapt to meet changing circumstances and changing risk. Um, it can mean pause and reflect events to do a better job of taking stock of progress and instituting course corrections uh, where that's needed. Uh, so here in Nepal, our new brand new country development and cooperation strategy has a major focus on reducing the risk faced by Nepal's most vulnerable and marginalized populations, um, as did Hari Oban, and on building resilience to recurrent shocks and stresses. Uh, we're gonna operationalize that in, in a lot of ways, including um, trying to build in really robust risk analysis, supporting locally led solutions, uh, disaster risk financing and other means of um, uh, addressing disaster risks and uh, through multi-year emergency programming like our new Bakari partnership. Um, so, you know, the Hario Bond one and two uh, partnerships in our view offer a, a lot of valuable lessons regarding risk management and adaptive approaches. Uh, of particular note was Hario Bond's forward leaning approach to gender equality and social inclusion, which has been mentioned uh, extensively and I, I think was a real strong point, was also the subject of another recent Wilson Center webinar. Uh, Hario Bond additionally benefited from a, a really well structured project coordination mechanism that has been mentioned um, quite a bit. And um, that was critical to the really strong engagement we've had at, at all three levels of government. And on that, that note of federalism, um, you know, as soon as the federalist uh, system uh, came into being, uh, Hari Oban really um, seized a moment to work very closely with local elected authorities um, immediately following the 2017 elections 
Mr. DeCall um, uh, spoke to this quite eloquently. The, the only thing I might add is that as a result of, of that really strong uh, local engagement, the project was able to leverage more than a million dollars in new investment to advance watershed management, climate change adaptation, and conservation-friendly enterprise development, all of which, of course, help reduce uh, the livelihood risks faced by um, uh, Nepali citizens. Uh, so in summary, uh, you know, this, this topic of risk management is, is something we're very focused on. I think it's something Haryoban uh, addressed quite well. Um, it's a multi-pronged approach that includes climate risk management, strong social and environmental safeguards, and adaptive project management, and of course, very close collaboration with our uh, government counterparts. Um, and I think Harry Obama has really exemplified um, many aspects of, of this um, kind of multi-pronged approach to risk that we take. We're quite proud of its successes. And I'd like to um, just close by thanking um, everyone who's helped make the project a success, uh, my fellow panelists and, and Mr. DeCall and, and all his counterparts within the Nepali government for I think it's what has been a, a really strong and successful partnership. And it, it couldn't have happened without um, everyone's contributions. So thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, we've had we have a number of questions that have come in, and I'm afraid we probably won't have time to get to all of them. So I'm going to do my best to uh, ask them quickly and maybe combine a couple. Um, one question uh, is about the 10 year timeline uh, of, of the program. <clears throat> so the question is, was it agreed from from the start? And what were the considerations made or uh, considerations in that decision? Um, the, the, the question comes from Juiced von Montfort. Sorry if you're saying I'm saying your name wrong. Uh, technical lead governance at WWF International. He says we would like to have more donors to adopt such long-term engagement approaches because you know the processes take time to build trust and relations, and that gives that allows for that um, partnership building. Uh, he also asked how were the funds managed. There was a small grants program, but what role did Indigenous peoples and local communities have in the allocation of the overall funding and strategic direction of the program? I'm going to add another question to that. Looking at the sort of there's the 10 year timeline of the program, but then looking forward into the uh, sustainability of its impacts. Um, uh, Hannah T. Fair Fairbank um, at the Global Environment Facility asks, if an evaluation is done 10 years from now, what is the prospect for lasting change? Why or why not? And what should donors and organizations learn from this? Um, Judy, I don't, you might be the best person to ask or to answer at least part of that question about the 10 year, 10 -year timeline. Sure. Yeah. So um, the 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 initial project was for five years, uh, from 2011 to 2016, and then um, USAID uh, issued another um, RFA for for a second phase. Uh, so it, yeah, initially, my understanding was that the the intent was was five years. Uh, but it, it was really valuable to get that extra time to be able to consolidate some of the, you know, the, the early results in phase one and to be able to, to work to scale them up, um, especially with the change in, in government and so on. Um, so that was my understanding. It was two, you know, five year, uh, five year phases um, planned for five years initially. Thank you. Does anybody else want to speak to the um, the sustainability of the project? So thinking about what an evaluation 10 years from now would find. Um, and then also the role of indigenous peoples and local communities in allocating the funding and strate strategic direction of the program. Uh, may I speak about the 10 years period and its sustainability? Uh, yeah, I, th I think the question is very good and very important questions. But uh, my suggestion is uh, conservation of biodiversity, you cannot compare with the physical development. Now, for example, the 10 years periods, if you compare with the highway construction or other infrastructure development, then you can say whether it is 10 years is suitable or not. But in conservation, the time is not a big matter unless and until you whether you continue or not because every year or every season the dynamics of the ecology is changing with different externalities that's why time always is not a big deal uh, but whether we continue or not to the biodiversity conservation that's why 
10 years period is a big period, long period to, to implement some activities. But if you do not plan for a long-term approach, then 10 years period sometimes not a big deal. Yeah, thank you very much. And if, uh, if I could just add on to that, I, I think it's a great question. And uh, Hannah, really nice to uh, hear your name and uh, appreciate the question. If I'm not mistaken, I think you may have had a role in the design of Hario Bond. So, you know, as, as you're probably aware, we're um, increasingly looking at ex post evaluations and 10 years is a long time, but I, I hope we'll have a chance to do some uh, rigorous uh, uh, kind of look back at, at the Hario Bond period down the line in three, four, even five years. And, and then I'll be able to give you a better answer. But I'd hope that the, the landscape scale approach that I think was really um, innovative and pioneering for, for Hario Bond at the time, that that would continue to show gains that we will still see a, a, a landscape scale uh, approach to conservation and landscape scale management strategies, um, which Hario Bond helped uh, establish. Um, I'd hope that the uh, um, community forestry successes that we've heard so much about um, will uh, you know, still be in place and, and hopefully even stronger. I, th I think there's some promising trends um, in, in that sector and, and some uh, really great organizational uh, capacity and energy as we've heard today. So I hope that we'd see that still being very successful. And then um, I'd, I'd hope that we'd see uh, real uh, durability in some of the livelihood gains and, and species uh, conservation gains that we've seen uh, uh, through Hario Bond. So, you know, we'll have to take a look back in, in 10 years, but I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that we are going to see some very durable results. Thank you, David. Uh, here's a question from DeMarc Schultz, joining with a group of state and USAID diplomats in Nepali language training. They would like to hear any comments on the challenges or successes regarding technology in areas far from the capital and secondary cities. As Mona noted, resources are power and changing who manages those resources changes the power dynamic. So how has technology use in the Hario Bond program also led to power dynamic shifts? And I should say that the, we've been really lucky for the last hour, almost and a half with our connection. Um, but the point that, you know, the technology access might be an issue. So is there somebody who would like to speak to that question? Um, I could say something really quickly. Um, I guess, uh, you know, we could talk about technology in terms of alternative energy. So relieving the burden of, of women collecting firewood uh, for, you know, heavy work taking up a long time, uh, providing them with alternative energy like biogas. Um, we also provided support to repairing some micro hydro schemes after the after the earthquake, for example. Uh, so this really helping to relieve the burden on women so that they have more time for um, you know other other household duties, uh, livelihoods work, um, agriculture, forest management, taking part in their communities. Um, and I think also the Jesse work did a lot of, of um, work with women on um, women appropriate uh, farming tools, for example, so tools that women can use as, as well as men. So I would say that, the, yeah, technology was really important. And then obviously um, communications improving all the time, you know, cell phone reach and so on, uh, enabling much better communication and, and uh, bringing very remote communities um, into the picture, being able to participate uh, more more fully. So yeah, technology very very important. I would say, in in that empowerment. Thank you, um, Lauren. I would also like to add there, um, like you know, one of the very important aspects of um, the JC action plan of Haryoban was the workload, uh, with lots of migration of economically active men and also women, but mostly men you know, the workload and the responsibility definitely like it came on women, that whole feminization of agriculture, you know, the feminization of the conservation work and all those things were noted. So something which um, Haryoban very, very minutely looked into and planned for was the workload of women mostly, you know, and also how it got redistributed the workload to the girl child and also barring them from other rights you know be it education be it full development and all those things 
So, you know, uh, something that Horyuban came up with, which is very much related with technology is this very simple ways, like very recently I went to this Bounty Lake, you know, where uh, we have Horyuban uh, initiative where this whole community forest users group and then the women's group are there. You know, the simple technology like uh, this corn shredder, you know, it takes so much of time. And when it takes so much of time, there is a time poverty. And when there is a time poverty, women cannot take part in any sort of policy engagement or any sort of other decision-making or livelihood initiative. So something that Haryoban came up with was this very simple local technologies, which help them to reduce their workload by giving them more time to represent themselves in different foras, in different you know, um, decision-making level. So definitely it was empowering and it gave more power to uh, these women. Well, that's a really important point and example. Um, I, you know, there's more questions, but I'm afraid we're coming to the end of our time. And, and one question that I, I wanna be sure we get to, to gives us a nice chance to sort of close it out with a final remark from each of you. Um, but I'm going to ask you to keep your responses to like one sentence, if you can. <laughs> I know it's a challenge. Um, you know, if, if you, if uh, I think speaking to the Hario Bond's legacy, if you can think about what the most important aspect of that legacy is, um, and and give us your your opinion on that in one or two sentences. Um, and I think that I will start with Barati. Um, thank you. I think maybe the uh, policy change is the important, uh, like our legacy all over here. Thank you. Thank you, Varati. Uh, Dr. Dakal. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think uh, there are a number of examples that Aliyoban uh, <coughs> bring tremendous changes in our biodiversity conservation. Uh, I, I would, I would say. A partnership, a partnership among the consortium partners and coordination with the government and the institutional arrangement is one part, but supporting in uh, the biodiversity conservation, uh, I think it is a very appreciative part of the project. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Judy, over to you. Thank you. I think um, in terms of moving things Forward. I, I, I'm going to say the, the climate adaptation approaches that we introduced both at community level, but then also for, for uh, building resilience of, of biodiversity. Great, thank you. Uh, David? Uh, let's see, I'd, I'd turn to a Nepali expression that, that Judy cited earlier, Haryoban uh, Nepal Kildan. Oh, I think it's the expression, uh, and it's, I think Harry Oban has shown the extent to which its, um, its natural resources really are, its wealth can really drive uh, sustainable development. I think we've seen that landscape scale approaches really work and uh, the impact of a really strong partnership. Thanks. Thank you. And Mona? I would definitely say that whole integration of gender equality and social inclusion in the conservation work, which brought in those integrated holistic approach made the conservation effort, the community conservation effort, you know, not just the technical one. So that's the legacy that Hollywood brought in. And it has proven that on it. That's great. Well, I wanna thank each of you for your extraordinary leadership on this project and for taking the time today to share with us the lessons learned. Um, I wish you all the best. Uh, for those watching, a recording of today's event will be available on the Wilson Center event page in the next day or so. So if you missed any of it, you can come back um, and we'll certainly be in touch in the months ahead. Thank you so much and thank you for tuning in. Thank you so much for hosting us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.